Now, it's very interesting for us to focus on international business people and the successes that they produce, not just for this country, but for overseas, and also, of course, for charity work as well, notably someone like Bill Gates. But what very often we don't do is focus on the people that live with them, work with them, and are, in fact, their life partners. And today, we're very privileged to have the wife of a very well-known businessman in this country, and, of course, a very well-known charity supporter as well, and that would be Betty Souter. Welcome. Thank you. Of course, Betty, for those of you who didn't realise, is the wife of Sir Brian Souter. Recently, Sir Brian Souter. Yes, that's correct. So what was that like? That was really, really good. It was very memorable, mm -hmm. a very memorable day. It was a family, a family day. We brought the, some of the, our children down. In fact, we all went, but only some, there were only three uh, of the children were allowed um, you know, into the mm -hmm. palace and the other one stayed outside and we picked him up and uh, all went for okay. lunch afterwards. But it was a very family uh, day and we were all very pleased and very proud um, of Brian. So what was the process of you finding out about it? Well, Brian had got a, a letter through saying that his name had gone forward and um, wondering whether he would accept um, this knighthood, um, to which he was delighted uh, to, to accept. And following that, we got information through. It was all very sort of top secret, and um, nobody had to be told. But we had got a, a letter through saying that um, you know, like his date was going to be in such and such a date, and um, how many tickets did he want? And he got. I think we automatically got two tickets. Um, it was Brian and a partner, and two other tickets. And we've got four children, so we had to put all the names into a heart yeah. because everybody wanted to be there. Yeah, of course. So we put the names into a heart, and um, in fact, the, the two oldest boys thought it was a fix because they, they <laughs> didn't happen to be in the room at the time, and they thought we had fixed it. But anyway, we managed to get Brian managed to get an extra ticket, and that was three of our children um, had the privilege of going down to the palace and and seeing. Uh, their dad getting a night. Nerve wracking when you arrive. He wasn't nervous before it, but I mean, you, you, then you have to get a, a sort of mm -hmm. suit, you've got to get the appropriate dress. Um, so there's a preparation involved, and all the kids had to get kitted out or, you know, new tied. Was he nervous? Um, it was a wee bit, I think it's, it's quite nervous or something, and I had gone and got an outfit, so it was a good excuse. So there was a, <laughs> sort, a lot of, it's a pre ramble um, excitement um, going on and uh, then we all went down to London, two of us missed a flight so there was right, just oh. the normal day to day excitement yeah. and events. We actually all got there, had a lovely just uh, a relaxing night, got up early in the morning and the first surprise was that Brian had said he would provide transport. He was going to provide a stagecoach and horses <laughs> and the children refused to get in it if he did because they didn't want to draw attention to themselves. Oh. So an old vintage Rolls Royce turned up and we were all squashed in it. We could hardly, there was hardly room for us all. Oh, so that was all part and parcel of the excitement of the day. Oh, for fantastic. Now, I suppose, yes, he's probably one of the most successful businessmen in the country, in the Scotland, in the whole of the UK. But obviously it's not always been like that. You've had to work, you both had to work really hard to make that business a success. So you've probably seen Brian go through all kinds of different things over the years to get there. There must have been major milestones for you. And how has that been? What, what's your supportive role like? Is that just there to be, to listen to what he's got to say about it, to support him, to advise him? or just let him get on with what he wants to do and then you support him by looking after the family? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, there have been pretty large milestones along the road and obviously we have to discuss the implications of that on the family. And, well, you know, if he's away doing something or caught up doing something of his time up, then there's less time to be around at home and involved with only day-to-day -day living. So. Obviously, it's a big decision and it's a family decision that has to be taken. So, I mean, he would discuss it with me and if I'm okay with it, then he would go ahead. If I'm not okay with it, I don't know what he would do. <laughs> we haven't had that situation So you've yet. always been okay with it up We've to now then? We've always been okay because it's always made sense. It's always been rational and logical in the next step and the next move. And, um, I mean, he is a very family-orientated mm -hmm. person, so he always makes sure that he's around as much as he can and he's at home at weekends mm -hmm. and uh, helps with the day-to-day the -day running of the home and, and the children. But yeah, there have been 
you know, he, he does come back and he does bounce ideas. He likes to talk about what he's doing, mm. his ideas, and it helps him, I think, in his mind, really, just trying to come to terms with what he should be doing next. And, you know, yeah, it, it, it bounces things off me. Mm-hmm. And But the, ultimately, he's the one that makes the decision whether he thinks. He's always got a gut feeling about what the next ste- step should be, what the next stage should be, which is probably why he's so successful, because he knows the business inside out and yeah. he, sort of, he knows you know where the next big challenge is going to be but he likes a challenge and there's always throughout our marriage there's always been something else and something big and you know a big opportunity is coming up mm-hmm. and and he enjoys that challenge and i think he really needs that challenge how do you relax well i mean i i relax but I, I love to read i mean i uh, when brian's away then i i get good opportunity at night at, in bed when the kids are in their bed to sort of relax and, and read um obviously if, if brian's away then you've got to be it's getting less now less heavy now that the children some of them are at university they're away from home so i've only got two at home just now so but in the early days, it was it was a lot. It was busy, and you were just you know the only way you relaxed, Julie, really, was when you were in your bed sleeping. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> familiar was, with yeah, that. <laughs> it was hard hard going. So now you get time to make for yourself. So reading. Yeah. What kind of books do you like? I like um, crime. Right. Read, um, well, Patricia Corn, all that yeah, kind of thing. That yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, I like that too. Yeah. That's interesting. So, 1992. You decided. You and Brian decided to open up the Suter Charitable Foundation. Mm-hmm. So what? I know it sounds like an obvious question, but what led you to to want to do that? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think it goes back to I mean, both of us attend a church, and both of us um, are um, committed Christians, and we've always given a tenth of our our money um, into the church. That's what we're told to do. So when you know the money started coming in, then it, it, you know we wanted to sort of spread it around and look for good causes and people do write into you and, and different charities wrote in and at that point we thought well this is a good opportunity to sort of you know look at causes look at charities and um, you know if we can help in some way we always see the sort of monetary side the money in itself isn't as important to Brian as the challenge yes uh, as as the money so it was always about you know we're stewardships of this money we feel that God has entrusted us with this, and if we can do some good with it, then all be it. So that's a very up. good way of looking at it yeah. as well. So, are there specific? Are there a range of charities that you support? Do yeah. you, or just support them on their own merits? No, or? there's a whole range. There are three trustees. My background is social work, so I'm interested in that side of things. There's a teacher, so she's in, interested in education, and Brian's probably interested in sort of um, church-based um, charities. Okay. This is, is this mainly in Africa or is it worldwide? Worldwide. Worldwide. So what's the latest, what's the latest thing you got involved in? The latest thing we got involved, well, we, we support Mary's Meals, we support, um, we're, we're involved in Swaziland, like okay. a feeding program. Mary's Meals, what's that? Mary's Meals is a charity, it's a Catholic-based right. charity, and they get into all the different countries, Africa, different countries, and they sort of give food um, to children and support. So it's quite a big charity, and the person who heads it up has got some awards recently, so he's getting acknowledged for the work um, and the growth that's been put into that charity. So what we feel that we like to get involved or put our money, um, you know, we don't put our money to buildings. We mm-hmm. prefer to put it to, um, you know, like if it's a sort of life or death situation, children starving, um, needing help, we, we like to sort of get involved in that type mm-hmm. of... And of course, you're both still based in Perth, which is where Brian was brought yeah. up. Is that where you were brought up as no, well? No, I was brought up in Glasgow. I'm okay. a city girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, only an hour and a half. Yeah. Right. But it's it's good that he's remained true to his roots because so many people that become successful businessmen, businesswomen, they get they obviously get the fruits of their labour and then move somewhere else. So it's good that he's actually stayed yeah. where he is. He's probably one of the few um, business people that have actually stayed um, and... Um, remain true to his roots because we mix with a lot of business people and a lot of them are expats um, but Brian is at home paying his taxes which are substantial yeah of course but, yeah. Um, yeah because he believes that you know that he loves Scotland he loves Perth and um, this is uh, this is where we choose to live 
I want to be part of that you know, community. Exactly. So you both have a passion for Scotland. You both have a religion for your spiritual mm -hmm. and your religious lives as well. Are there any particular ambitions that you've personally got for the next two or three years that you want to achieve that you've not quite achieved yet? I um, I don't really think I'm the type of person that has big ambitions. <laughs> I, I, especially with four children mm -hmm. when they were younger, it was a case of just getting from day to day as opposed to looking forward or planning ahead. But uh, I mean, I am involved in various things. I'm involved in the charity. At, w at, w at some point, I would like to be able to actually go and visit some of the charities that we support um, in Africa and different different parts of the country. I would like to do that and just be freer uh, with my time to be able to mm -hmm. do that sort of thing. I think, given my social work background, I would find that very enjoyable. Now you're going to be taking part soon in the International Women's Day. Yeah. Now, from a woman's perspective, what do business women and women generally, what should they be looking to achieve from that? Where should it be taking them in terms of is there still a great amount of inequality for women around the world? Is, is that your perception? Is those kind of organisations there to help and promote women get a better deal really? Well I think it is. I mean I think there are still a lot of opportunities out there for women. I don't know that, um, I mean we talk about equal opportunities. I think women are very um, able people, I think. Uh, I, I joke with my children that women are, are the only ones that can multitask. Men can't multitask. Yeah, well, that's pretty true. But because <laughs> if you've got children and you juggle things, I think yeah. you're more prone to be able to do a few things at the one time. I think I don't think a women's law is always easy. I think it is very difficult for women to make it. I think either in the business world or elsewhere. People still, even if you're just a housewife and mm. you're dealing with workmen, I think people still see a woman, oh, it's just a woman, whereas they would give more credibility yeah. if it was a man. So I think there are still a lot of challenges mm. out there for women. Uh, but, I mean, I, I, I'm under no illusion that women won't, you know, make it and, mm. and fight through the barriers. And, um, you know, and what, what really is part of my charity hat is um, there's, we, we involved, we're involved with a charity called Stop the Traffic. Okay. And there's so many women just now who are actually being trafficked. And just in the newspaper the other day, there were women in Dundee um, who were being sold as slaves and, you know, drug addicts. And you think, you don't expect that in this country. Mm. You maybe expect it some of the Eastern Bloc countries, mm. but not over here. And yet, it's everywhere. And I think even as a mother, you just think, what is happening? And, you know, some of these girls are getting taken into this situation and they're worth so much more and their lives are worth so much more. That's incredibly worthwhile because these women tend to be in many cases minor drug users to begin with or they're in a desperate situation yeah. get introduced to drugs and once they are complete addicts then these men yeah. usually can do with them what they yeah. want. But I think they also they lie to them to get them yeah. into the country in the yes, first place. Yeah. They promise them a good good job, a, you know, a different life. Um, they promise them all the things that they, they are really sort of looking for or hopeful of and then they get here and they're, they're, they're sort of shut in a squalor flat or whatever. So I think that's happening here and now, and there's so many obstacles, I think, just to, and barriers yeah. just to sort of try and get through. And um, so we're still not where we want to be, I think, as mm. women. I think there's still a lot more opportunities for mm. us and uh, a fight out there for us to sort of mm. take. What I really like about you is you are so grounded because there are women that have become part of a relationship that becomes incredibly successful, they've, in, they've contributed to it, and then at a certain point they think, well actually, you know, I've got all everything that I need now, I don't really want to be bothered with that. You're, you're still grounded at every level. You can think about people that are in that situation and want to work to help them, and that's actually, I think, is that part of your spirituality? Is that part of your faith that keeps you grounded? I think it is. I think it's a part of my faith and it's also a part of, um, yeah, yeah. I think it is a, a large part of my faith in that you, you don't see yourself as being any better than anybody else. I mean, everybody thinks the same in God's sight. I mean, I'm no better than anybody else. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's probably the foundation okay. that, that, you know, keeps us grounded. And I would say Brian's the same. I mean, people meet Brian and think, well, he's just an ordinary, I don't know who they expect, but we're, we're still very yeah. hands-on with our yeah. children. We still work in the church. We still, you know, get our sleeves rolled up and make the tea and get involved like everybody else. We don't see ourselves as being any better than anybody else. Well, 
Are you technically Lady Souter now? Yeah, technically. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically. Lady Souter, it's been an absolute pleasure for you to come in. Well, a pleasure for you to probably wasn't a yeah. pleasure for you to come in. It's <laughs> yes. an absolute pleasure for you to come in and meet with us. And thank you very much. Thank and you. hopefully we'll be seeing more of you in the yeah, future. Thank you.